Hello, ladies. <laughs> um, okay. Standing here talking to you guys about postpartum depression is not something I ever thought I would be doing. Um, up until a few months ago, no one even knew postpartum was something that I had gone through. It's something that I went through alone for, for a lot of reasons. I felt a lot of shame and guilt, and I thought that it made me a bad mom. And um, I didn't even know what postpartum was, so I didn't even know that's what I was going through when I was going through. Um, as Brittany said, I have two daughters. I have Raylan, who is five, and Emma, who is two. And Raylan, my five-year-old, is the one that I experienced the postpartum with. And I'm, I don't remember exactly how long it lasted, but it was well, well over a year. Um, I kind of tried to tuck the memory of it away, trying just to forget about it. <laughs> but, um... It kind of started resurfacing the day before our family photo shoot with Irene, and she rode in my truck with me to and from our um, photo shoot destination, and we just talked a lot, had a nice time. And on the way home, I had mentioned to her that I had postpartum with Greenland, and that I wish I had known more about it when I was going through it. Um, and it was at that moment I felt God put on my heart to do this and to speak about it. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, God, like, I agree. I think someone needs to talk about postpartum. Um, it's not going to be me. I, no one knows I've had it, and I've never told my story before, but I will help you find somebody. <laughs> um, we'll see how that worked out. <laughs> So our planning meeting for Mom to Mom for the Year was that Sunday, and I was prepared to offer up the subject um, so we could find a speaker for postpartum. And so when that part of the meeting came up, I, I did that. I was like, well, can I just throw out a subject? And I think it was Kelsey who said, well, is it one that you can talk about? Because that's usually how this works. <laughs> and I was like, dang it, I'm busted. <laughs> So I, I expressed my hesitations, and they were all super supportive, all the ladies on the steering, because that's what they do. And ultimately, we decided I would pray about it. Um, the next morning, Monday morning, I woke up, and the weight was still really heavy on my heart to talk about this. So I texted Brittany, and I told her very hesitantly I would do it. <laughs> and. You guys, God is just amazing. Like, I can't tell you how good he is because as soon as I sent that text, like, that weight was lifted and God just spoke to me. He gave me all the tools and all the memories that I needed to put this together. And um, I'm really thankful for his help on getting this together. It's been a healing journey for me, for sure. Um, and... I mean, he, he's just good. Like, he knew what I needed. I, um, he broke a chain that I didn't know I was dragging through this process. So I'm actually really thankful to be up here today uh, sharing my story with you guys. Um, and I hope that by me saying yes, that anyone who's going through something similar can just find some hope and just know you're not alone. So um, before I share my story, I want to talk about what postpartum depression is. Um, but first, I want to mention what it's not. Postpartum depression is not a reflection of you as a mother, and it is not a defining factor of who you are. Like, you guys, I let this define me for so long. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, what is postpartum depression? It's also known as PPD. And all the information I'm going to share comes from the March of Dimes website, so you can find all this on there too. Um, PPD is a medical condition that many women get after having a baby, and it's a type of depression, and for half of women who are diagnosed with PPD, it's their first time experiencing depression. It often starts within one to three weeks of having a baby, and it PPD differs from uh, the baby blues or feelings of sadness in that the baby blues typically go away within two weeks. 
So, if you think you're going through something, and it has been longer than two weeks, please talk to somebody. Um, don't do what I did, and just internalize it, because that's going to lead to a very scary place. <laughs> um, according to March of Dimes, one in seven women are affected by PPD, and I think that number is just a reflection of diagnosed cases. Um, personally, I think that number is a lot higher. And um, signs and symptoms include feeling depressed most of the day, every day, feeling panicked or scared all the time, feeling shame, guilt, or like a failure, having severe mood swings, having little interest in things you normally really like to do, feeling tired all the time, eating a lot more or a lot less than is normal for you, gaining or losing weight, um, having trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, having trouble concentrating or making decisions, and there can be changes in how you think about yourself or your baby, which include um, having trouble bonding with your baby, thinking about hurting yourself or your baby, and having thoughts of suicide. Um, you might have PPD if you have five or more of these signs or symptoms that last longer than two weeks. Personally, I had at least eight of these. I had feeling shame, guilt, or like a failure, feeling panicked or scared all the time, having little interest in things you normally like to do, feeling tired all the time, having trouble sleeping, having trouble concentrating or making decisions, having trouble bonding with your baby, and thinking about hurting yourself or your baby. That's really hard to admit. Um, <laughs> PPD not only affects mom, but it can affect baby too. Uh, Marcia Dime says, this is why it's important to treat PPD as soon as possible. Um, if it's untreated, you can skip your postpartum checkups and not follow instructions from your healthcare provider. You may find it hard to bond with your baby. Your baby may not breastfeed long. PPD may make it hard for you and your baby to get used to breastfeeding. And to that, I just want to make a quick side note that you will never know why mom is choosing to formula feed versus breastfeed. She may be fighting a battle that you I have no idea she's fighting. Um, and I guarantee she's just trying the best she can. So no shame in formula feeding. Um, your baby may not get the medical care he or she needs. PPD may make it hard for you to take care of your baby if he or she is sick. You may not see health problems in your baby that need quick attention and care. And your baby may have learning, behavior, and development problems and mental health problems. Um, again, I had a hard time bonding with my baby. I struggled with breastfeeding. And my daughter has anxiety. I don't know if she's just wired that way or if it's just a result of her or of my untreated PPD. Um, it's not exactly known what causes PPD, but it can happen to any mom after having a baby. Possible causes include genetics, changes in hormone levels, um, low thyroid hormone levels, and there's also an extensive list on the March of Dimes website of possible risk factors, and the one that I want to touch on is negative thoughts and feelings about being a mom. That can include having doubts that you can be a good mom, putting pressure on yourself to be a perfect mom, feeling that you're no longer the person you were before you had your baby, having no free time for yourself, feeling you're less attractive after having your baby, feeling tired and moody because you aren't sleeping well or getting enough sleep. And I had all of these risk factors. <laughs> um, the good news is PPD is treatable, but you have to tell someone you're going through something in order to get help. I did not have the courage to ask for help when I was going through this, um, but God's given me the courage now to tell my story. So um, here is my story. I had a super normal pregnancy. I had just one emotional breakdown over hot dogs. <laughs> uh, my husband and I were in City Market. We were just looking for something for lunch, and uh, nothing sounded good to me. And my husband very rationally, we had hot dog ones at home, he very rationally suggested hot dogs. 
and I lost it. I just started falling right there in the middle of City Market. I was like, we need to leave right now. And I like stormed out of there. And my poor husband had no idea what was going <laughs> But other than that, like I had a really normal pregnancy. Um, so Raylan was due on August 27th and my water broke on the evening of August 13th. And so we went to the hospital and checked in at the ER. And they told us who the on-call doctor was, and I was really excited because it was um, my normal doctor, which that's something we all hope for. So we went upstairs, got checked into our labor room, and the doctor came in to talk to us, and it was um, not the doctor they told us it would be. It was someone I had never met. Um, he was over here from the front range, just kind of serving as like a relief doctor for our doctors here so they could have the weekend off. Um, he was really nice and wonderful, but that was just like a curveball. ball. Never met you, please deliver my baby. <laughs> um, so fast forward to the morning, and I started having contractions around 7 a.m. Uh, things progressed pretty quickly. I got an epidural and I started pushing around 11 a.m. And I pushed for about an hour and a half until Raylan kind of made her debut. And instead of getting that really like magical moment where they just lay a baby on you and you get to bond and like feed and just spend time with them, um, they put Raylan in the newborn little car where they do their like weight and vitals and everything. And um, that's where they left her. And things, I just remember things getting kind of chaotic in my room. And all of a sudden, there were, there were like four or five nurses, and the doctor was kind of ordering them around to find things, because um, he didn't know where anything was. And he told me that I wouldn't stop bleeding, and he couldn't figure out where the bleeding was coming from. So um, thank God my husband was right there, because I just looked at him like crying. I was just terrified. And he just kept reassuring me it was OK, and that like the it wasn't as bad as the chaos in the room made it seem like. So um, the doctor ended up getting like some long tom things, I don't know, pulling something out and like putting some stitches in and putting things back. <laughs> so then the bleeding stopped, everything ended up okay, but I, I really missed out on that first like bonding time with Raylan. Definitely didn't go away in the dream of mine. So later we moved out of the labor room and into our other room, and Raylan would not wake up to eat, so a nurse force-fed her a bottle, because uh, they were concerned about her getting jaundice, and we actually ended up staying an extra night at the hospital um, until her blood sugar levels were good enough for us to take her home. And during our stay at the hospital, Raylan and I just couldn't figure out breastfeeding. It was so frustrating. Um, I thought it was gonna be easy, and it wasn't. And I ended up having to use a nipple shield to have any sort of success at breastfeeding, which just added a lot of extra work and stress. Uh, there was also a time in the hospital where Lynn did not stop crying. That was her thing. And we asked a nurse for a binky, but this was during their wonderful no binky phase at the hospital. <laughs> so instead of getting a binky, we got a lecture about how we would not be getting a binky. And we had an irritated nurse aggressively swallowing and shushing her baby, which, I mean, it freaked my husband and I. <laughs> so needless to say, our time at the hospital was not the dream I had imagined. <laughs> So the morning we left the hospital to take Raylan home, I just remember feeling overwhelmingly terrified. I had so much anxiety about taking care of this human and trying to keep her alive. I felt like there were so many rules I had to follow. Um, no binkies, first of all. I had to wake her up every two hours to eat or she would get jaundice. Um, I had to breastfeed because if I formula fed, I was a failure. Baby had to sleep on back in a crib on a cold, hard mattress because if there were blankets or pillows or stuffed animals in there with her, those could get over her face and suffocate her. Um, what if I didn't swaddle her good enough? What if her swaddle came loose and got over her face and suffocated her? What if she fell into six? So already, I'm 
been having a hard time bonding with my baby, having trouble breastfeeding, feeling like a failure, and feeling panicked and scared all the time. Um, my husband would try to get advice from other friends of ours that were already parents, but nothing, nothing eats my mind. And I never did tell him how freaked out I was. Um, and he's a guy, so he's not great with emotions. He didn't catch on to really how how far down this road I already was. Um, my mom came out for two weeks to help, which was wonderful, but she's very much a nature person in the nature versus nurture battle, so I've never been comfortable talking to her about emotions or, or this or anything. So um, my mom and I would take shifts being awake around the clock with Raylan, Partially because she had to be up every two hours to eat, and also because I felt like if someone was not awake, constantly checking on her, like watching her breathe, like it was very real in my mind that she was going to quit breathing, and she was going to die. Um, I remember one morning after my mom had been like on shift, I came out of my bedroom into the living room to see my baby like laying on the couch by herself. She was only a few days old. And my mom was just up letting the dogs outside, but I, and I didn't say anything to her, but I just internalized how, like, my baby almost just died. Like, she could have just pulled off this couch and hit her head and died. Like, that literally, in my mind, we just had a near-death experience. Um, so that wasn't healthy. And, um, so, then I remember I started feeling depressed, and, like, I wasn't the person I was before I had my baby. I was having doubts that I could be a good mom. Um, Raylan was a really difficult baby. She cried all the time. We couldn't get her to sleep in her crib. Um, we tried all the methods proven to get them to sleep in the crib, and she just wasn't having any of it. Um, so the only place she would sleep was in bed, so that's what we did, we co-slept. And um, that filled me with a lot of guilt and like fear, because if we co-slept, I could roll over on her and I could be the one to kill her. Um, I remember a day when my husband was at work and the whole day was just a struggle with Raylan. It was one of those days she just would not stop crying. And it was about 30 minutes before my husband got home from work and I put her in her crib and I went outside and walked to the edge of our five acre property and I just waited for him to get home so he could, he could take care of her because I was just done, like, I was just done that day. Um, so then it started happening, and I'm not exactly sure when it started happening, but I started having these thoughts, um, these crazy thoughts about harming myself and my baby. You see, I had no idea that what I had been going through this whole time was postpartum depression. And I like to think that if I had talked to someone before I got to this point, it wouldn't have got to this point. But I didn't. Um, I kept brushing it off as I was like a new mom, and like, I'm just gonna get the hang of it, this is all gonna go away. And I also felt like if I had admitted I was struggling, I would be admitting that I wasn't cut off to be a mom. Um, and now that I was having these thoughts, I definitely wasn't going to be telling anybody, because now I was terrified people were going to take my baby away from me. Um, so there I was. I was in this dark, lonely, scary place that I had let my mind take me to. And it was there like that God met me. God met me right there, right where I was, in this deep hole. And he gave me a of hope. He told me, I gave you this child, I trust you. And I clinged onto that. <laughs> and this thought led me to discernment, discernment that this voice that was giving me these thoughts was of the enemy. It was not of God. God didn't want me going through this. I did not want to be going through this. Um, so God gave me the strength to start fighting back. And that's what I did. I just started praying that God would heal me and take these thoughts away from me. And every time one of these thoughts would start like creeping up, 
I would capture it and I would replace it with this truth that God gave me, that he gave me this child and he trusts me. And that is just huge. Like, that saved my life. Um, God, God's grace absolutely saved, saved me. Um, so, that was pretty heavy. And remember that I did not know the entire time what I was going through was postpartum depression. I was literally watching an episode of Scrubs when I learned about what I had been going through. So, we're going to play that clip for you. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> someone who's gone through it themselves. Fine. Who? You cannot believe if I am to witness. you're struggling in a marriage or with a friend or 
with a job or a parent or anything. Whatever your battle is today, guys, that does not define you. God does. Um, so, with that said, I brought a little sticker for everybody to show you my water bottle. Because I'll, I'll pass it out afterwards. But it just says you are who God says you are. And it has different points, different words from scripture about who we are in Christ. And um, I just want you guys to put that sticker wherever you need to, to constantly remind yourselves like how wonderful and beautiful and loved you guys are. Okay? Um, I'm reading a book right now by Brene Brown called Dare to Lead. And I love this book. In this book, she's addressing... Um, how we are taught that vulnerability is weakness, but in reality, vulnerability is so much more than weakness. Um, for what act of courage does not first require being vulnerable? So, I would like to close in prayer. <laughs> um, thank you, Father, for just bringing these women here today and for giving me the opportunity and the courage to, to share my story and the healing that you've given me through this process. And Father, I just ask that you would meet these women right where they are in whatever battles they're facing. And Father, just let them know that you're there fighting for them and with them and that they're not alone. Um, and please just give them courage. And Father, I just ask that you guide our discussions and our table time today, and please just help us to be vulnerable with one another and just to open up to each other. And I just ask that you bless these women. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.